set fire to the village, thereby killing quite a number of the residents. So these antiquities that we see, and I try to make this clear to the soldiers because they're now guarding the sites, it, it's part of a major crime organization. And no matter how beautiful they look in Madison Avenue, they're still stolen, and they represent the destruction of history, if you will, the murder of history, which can never be reconstructed once those things have left the earth. When I introduce Iraq to them, of course, they've already gotten a sense of the layout from the other briefings. I tell them, obviously, that the ancient name is Mesopotamia, which is Greek for the land between the two rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates. I emphasize that Iraq has been associated with archaeology from its inception because it was an archaeologist, Gertrude Bell, who drew the lines of the modern state of Iraq after World War I. She was Honorary Oriental Secretary for the British government and, of course, a friend of T.E. Lawrence, uh, Lawrence of Arabia, whom you see down here. What I found is that the common bond among all the soldiers is a knowledge of the Bible. So I tend to emphasize things in Genesis. They can relate most easily to Iraq by um, my raising issues that were names that they know of from having studied the Bible. So I try to put in a few new discoveries that have been linked to passages in the Bible, such as Gerbekli Tepe, even though that's in southeastern Turkey near Urfa um, rather than in Iraq per se. But the excavations here have been extraordinary. Um, this is between the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers, although again in southeastern Turkey. And what it's yielded, the excavations there under the joint direction of the Urfa Museum and the German Archaeological Institute, Klaus Schmidt, is an astounding open-air sanctuary with T-shaped limestone pillars which have relief carvings of wild birds, serpents, um, reptiles, headless humans. And they are about three meters tall. Some of them may even be taller than that, double that height. This is 9,000 BC, dated by radiocarbon, um, and thus 7,000 years older than Stonehenge. The archaeological evidence from here shows the, the first domestication of cereal, so einkorned wheat, and nearby the first domestication of wild pigs. So it seems to be a site related to the transition from hunter-gatherers to farming, and has been linked to the Garden of Eden, which we're told is near a river um, that ultimately uh, moves into four rivers, included in which are the Tigris and the Euphrates. And obviously at the um, end of the story of the Garden of Eden, people begin farming. So some have speculated that it's a site like this that lies at the origin of the story of the Garden of Eden as it ultimately developed and was written down in Genesis. And in fact, the, the um, archaeological officials in Turkey have plans to develop this into a major tourist site. Come visit the Garden of Eden. I take them through the seven, <coughs> or, uh, the seven major periods that I've identified for Iraq, and then I take them into Afghanistan. I can only give them a few facts for each of the periods, but I try to emphasize things that will have some meaning to them. Starting with Sumer, I give them an introduction to the ziggurat, which is, of course, a stepped mud brick platform with the shrine on the top, sacred to a god and simply meaning to be high um, in Sumerian. Many of them will have seen the ziggurat of Ur, which is what I'm showing you here, and they will have seen um, the remains of the Tower of Babel in Babylon because, of course, that's the site of one of the military bases. I show them, in addition, things relating to religion that were stolen from the Baghdad Archaeological Museum and then repatriated with the assistance of Matthew Bogdanos uh, and the Marines, one of the most prominent examples of which is this alabaster vase, three feet tall, which shows crops, animals, worshipers of the goddess Inanna, whom you see up here, a Sumerian fertility goddess. You see the base on which it originally stood, and then the same base after it was recovered by Matthew Bogdanos. So a vase that represents a, a religious New Year's festival. There are many other examples of this, but this is one of the best preserved of that group. What Matthew Bogdanos did, by the way, was to form partnerships with the mosques and with the imams. And so one of the ways in which so many things were repatriated was because the imams volunteered to collect them, no questions asked. And a lot of the antiquities um, were retrieved in that way. 
I go into the development of writing because, of course, that's one of the byproducts of the formations of the ziggurats. They're responsible for keeping track of the produce, the goods that are coming into um, the ziggurat complex. So this leads to the, the development of writing, the first schools, the first libraries, the first attempts at astronomy, and the first narratives, where we get an idea of how humans viewed their interaction with gods. And one of the most prominent examples of that is the flood story, originally from the third millennium BC, although our best example comes from um, an Assyrian library of the seventh century BC. So I go through the Mesopotamian version of the flood story, which is that um, the Sumerian Noah, a man named Utnapishtim, um, was charged with collecting animals um, in a boat and um, surviving a flood that had been sent by Enlil um, to punish humankind. So he did this. The, the flood came for seven days and seven nights, and then it was over. He survived and repopulated um, the earth. We see this story again, of course, in Noah. You see it again in classical mythology with Deucalion and Pyrrha. Why are there so many flood stories? One of the um, explanations that's been proposed is that in the sixth millennium BC, the Black Sea, which had initially been a freshwater lake, became a saltwater lake when the waters of the Mediterranean and the Aegean moved through northwestern Turkey, creating the Dardanelles, the Sea of Marmara, and the Bosphorus, and gradually turning the Black Sea from freshwater to saltwater. In the course of so doing, in the middle of the sixth millennium BC, there were, of course, a lot of floods throughout the Near East. Some have claimed that it's these floods that result from the change in sea level um, and consistency of the Black Sea that gave rise to so many flood narratives in so many cultures. Although, of course, there were lots of floods in antiquity. We needn't posit just one source, um, one particular flood to give rise to all of these flood stories. It happened all the time. Who were the people who were writing the flood stories and building the ziggurats? We get a sense of them from the royal tombs of Ur in southern Iraq or southern Mesopotamia. So I take them into those tombs, which fortunately I know something about because some of these treasures are at the University of Pennsylvania Museum. Um, we're dealing now with the middle of the third millennium BC, so I so show them some of the royal tombs as they were found, so with skull, diadem, and necklace, and then reconstruction uh, of those diadems, gold, lapis lazuli, carnelian, this being the tomb of a woman named Fuabi. And this dates to about the time of the first of the major wars at Troy, so close to the destruction of the second city of Troy. And if you look at some of the detailing on the jewelry, you'll see the same sort of thing occurring in the so-called treasure of Priam at Troy, which has led some to propose that there were craftsmen moving back and forth between Mesopotamia and northwestern Turkey already in the third millennium BC. We know this is Puabi because we have the cylinder seal from her tomb that gives her name. So this gives me a chance to introduce cylinder seals, which are among the objects that are most frequently looted from sites in Iraq. Stone cylinders rolled out on clay to prove the authenticity of documents or to signal ownership. And again, if you went onto eBay, um, as I did this morning, you could pull up any number of examples, perhaps more cylinder seals than anything else of those objects that have been smuggled out of uh, Iraq. So I make the point that these cylinder seals not only tell us something about the administration of the area, but about relations between humans and gods and their environment. And if we don't find them in context, this is again part of history that has been destroyed. I then give them the macabre part of the royal tombs of Ur, which is that among these tombs, and there were 1,800 graves altogether, uh, the tomb of Pu'abi had 73 officials of the queen who went down into the, the so-called death pit with her and committed suicide on the occasion of the funeral. So drinking from a large um, vat of poison, not unlike the um, initiates into the cult of Jim Jones um, in Guyana in the 70s, which is certainly something that the officers remember. And I also make the point that music formed a prominent part of these ceremonies. And the musicians would 